I don't know if you paid attention in 2016, but Americans sent a clear message. We're tired of this. If I can have your attention, I'd like to introduce Peter Kruger. He's one of the partners of Capital Partners. And he's going to be talking about taxes. The whole theme of this meeting is taxes, taxes, and more damn taxes. Peter Kruger, he's a lobbyist with their firm, with the Petroleum Markers convenience, um, convenience stores, among many other clients. Go ahead and continue to enjoy your lunch, and I know you will. It's very good. And I want to thank Ray and the... Uh, the club for inviting me. I told Ray that I thought that uh, he'd gone through all the good speakers he could find and because of vacations and all they were not available and so he went to the injured reserve list and that's where he found me. So um, anyway, thank you, Ray. Um, Texas, and, and I want to approach initially and then Trey Abney, who's batting cleanup, is going to talk about some some more general taxes, commerce tax, and things of that nature. But the fuel tax is probably one of the most, and it's indexing the fuel taxes, is most misunderstood tax uh, in Washoe County, or really in the whole state. Two, two jurisdictions, Washoe and Clark, have fuel indexing. So let me ask, uh, first, who has arrived in Reno since 2011. Okay, not very many. Well, that's okay. So those of you that were here in 2010 had a chance to vote yes or no on question five, which was the second round of fuel indexing. And I contend to this, this day that uh, the average voter had no clue of what their vote they were voted for. And passed by a pretty decent margin. Uh, just to give you a little background, the road builders and everybody went to the county commission back in 2004 and said that the uh, we were had no local indexing, so they relied on the some of the federal, and we still had some federal highway money, uh, now virtually none, uh, some state money, and then uh, the RTC or Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, is the body uh, that's made up of elected officials uh, from in, from the region are the people who decide what uh, road projects, what uh, rehabilitation, and uh, those kind of road projects um, are are funded and and are are constructed. So, 2004, uh, the voters were asked. Uh, to approve an indexing tied to something called that we're all familiar with CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and that's you know a floating formula that the Feds generate, Department of Commerce generates every year, and it is a so it is a percentage of the at then of the CPI that generated this index amount, and it's added to the federal tax, the state tax and the county tax. So there already was a county tax. Washoe was at a dime. Most of the counties are at a dime. There's still a few that are, that are at a nickel. So uh, on top of federal, state, and county, indexing was added. Well, it became apparent to the road builders that uh, the amount of money generated off of the CPI, remember this was a period of time before uh, the big bust, and uh, revenues uh, were pretty significant. And remember too, uh, uh, highway, highway planning is, is a long, long-term process. The Southeast Connector that I'll talk about a little bit more is, is a result of this indexing tax. But that, that's not something just happened in the last four or five years. That's happened, that was the process that getting the right away and doing all that lasted lasted many, many, at least a decade. So it wasn't the indexing at the time tied to the consumer price index was not at all um, generating uh, enough money to do all the projects that 
the citizens of uh, Washoe County think they need, not and maybe want, not need. So there was a vote in 2012, and again, remember, we're a uh, a state that doesn't have home rule, which is really a good thing. And I won't lecture you on home rule, but it, all the power that the municipalities have and derive are from the legislature. Unlike many states like California communities, if a uh, city or a county wants to raise taxes, they can do that. That can't happen here. So Washoe County for a second time went to the legislature and asked essentially for permission to put on the ballot a second indexing. And this formula is tied to the producer price index, which uh, it takes into effect construction and more of the, of the items that uh, are tied to road construction and, and uh, manufacturing. So it, it, and it generates more money. So uh, we get through that election cycle, the voters approved, uh, indexing for a second time, and away we go. Now, as a voter, we probably all of us thought and didn't or really didn't think about what was going to happen. How is, you know, okay, so this money is going to come in, uh, and, uh, you know, based on how much it was, we were going to save the money, and then when we had the money, we'd build the project. Well, there's enough of you in here that are my age that remember when there were not credit cards. And believe it or not, there was a period for those of you that are around, uh, haven't been around that long, there was a period of time when credit cards did not exist. Well, for the county and the city, a credit card is a bond. So instead of waiting to have the money to build the Southeast Connector, and this is the part I think most voters don't understand or citizens don't understand, this RTC, Regional Transportation Commission, went out and bonded against a revenue stream that was known, but was tied to ever-increasing revenue. The stream wasn't going to quit. You can't shut it off. So once it's bonded, the bond covenants say that each year, and in our case, it's July 1st, uh, our uh, indexing goes up automatically, and that increased share of money goes to retire the bonds. So if citizens of Washington County said, we've had enough, and I haven't told you how much it is, but I, probably some of you know, but we said, we've had enough of this indexing. And the number for the total index here in, in Washoe County, federal, state, and local in indexing is 84 cents. So on top of the price of fuel, there's 84 cents that is the federal tax, the state tax, the other county tax in indexing. So 86 cents of every gallon of gasoline that you purchase, and there's a similar scheme in, in place for diesel fuel. But so now we've got a, a situation where this tax can't be stopped until the bonds are retired. Now, Washoe County is RTC has quit issuing new bonds because it became very apparent that we're going to be over a dollar on this indexing and in not foreseeable future. There are bonds out there that have at least 20 years. Most of those bonds were 25 and 30 year bonds. So you can see we got a favorable rate. We got a favorable in, you know, interest rate. Well, this this time we everybody gets a pretty favorable index or uh, interest rate. But be that as may, we can't turn this thing off. Now, as again, the voters, we all could say enough is enough, and we're not going to index anymore. But all that meant is that they could not no longer issue bonds uh, against the index. But every July first, and it went up about three cents uh, last July. It's been as high as five cents. So uh, the other thing is it, it always comes out in in tens and hundreds and thousands of a cent. And you may wonder, well, if if the if it went up uh, 2.87 cents, uh, how come that doesn't show at the pump? Well, first off, those of you who've been around for a while know that 
and, and if you ask me why, I'll tell you later, but the why it's always nine tenths. You might wonder, you've never, very seldom, in fact, when indexing first happened in, in 2004, a few gasoline dealers changed it to like four tenths or five tenths, but it's, they rounded up to uh, nine tenths. So it's 263 a gallon and, and nine tenths. So I'm telling you all this just to give you the way of background of where we are with, with indexing. So we're up, the street price in Washoe County went up three cents, rounded up, it was 2.87 something. Um, and next year, depending on inflation, depending on the PPI, the production for producer's price index, that figure um, will go up. It can't go down. Remember, this is a situation where the bond covenants, um, you know, if, if it was somehow there was no increase in the crease in the CPI, the, the, the amount from last year, the current year, would, would apply to the following year. So it's a pretty vicious circle. Now, a couple of other things you need to know. The federal government hasn't raised their gasoline tax in more than 10 years. It's eight, the federal tax is, is uh, 18.4 cents a gallon. So more than 10 years. Well, at some point, the federal gasoline tax is going to go up. I mentioned to you earlier about it used to be there was a thing called iced tea and some fancy names for the federal government funding uh, highways in Nevada. And that worked its way down from the state highway system into uh, uh, the RTCs or the Regional Transportation Commission. The state tax, the last time the state uh, gasoline tax went up was in 1995. And it hasn't, it went up two and a half cents and it currently sits at 23 cents uh, a gallon. So we got 18.4 federal, 23 cents of uh, state tax to fund the state highways. And then you've got uh, the county option, which is uh, not indexing. That's another, a dime there. And then there's a few, because if you do the math and add my indexing number in there, uh, you'll see that uh, the actual indexing number uh, here in Washoe is, uh, is 31, 31 cents, 32 cents uh, a gallon. So add all that up. And you get to 80, 80, round 80 cents. But it's like there's a few mills here and mills there that uh, that add up. So that's kind of where we are. That kind of that's where we are on fuel indexing. Why is that important? I think the lesson for all of us is that when our local governments propose another uh, source of revenue, and they will. We need to ask the right questions. Uh, it's, it's not enough that the, we're going to feel good that we have good roads. Now, I'll be the first to say uh, Washoe County road system is in pretty decent shape. And, I'll, and I, I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again because it launches into a whole other area, is without indexing, we would not have the Southeast Connector. Now, none of us have driven on the Southeast Connector. It's called Veterans. Memorial Parkway or anyway, it's going to be for anybody that lives uh, east of Reno or in Sparks or and wants to go south or vice versa, lives south and wants to go out to Vista or out somewhere in Sparks, the Southeast Connector is going to be, a, you know, a wonderful thing. And it, but it was paid for by indexing dollars. And in all the projects that you you see going on of of a regional nature are indexing dollars. So I think the question is, and I told uh, Assemblyman Hansen this, that uh, the business community we get all the we're we've done a great job of encouraging businesses to come to Northern Nevada. Um, we have to house them. We've got a housing problem. We've got a huge housing problem. We the NIMBYs uh, are alive and well. We just we have a client that had the heart one of the hardest times getting a project approved off the Mountain Rose Highway 
and maybe some of you live on Pond Lane uh, or uh, Callahan, this will be enough for you to throw tomatoes at me. But uh, it was approved by the Planning Commission by a four to one vote. The, uh, the uh, homeowners out off of in that area um, appealed it to the County Commission and the County Commission uh, just last week approved the project. So the initial projects to about 260 one homes uh, in that area. Now these are not affordable housing. These are homes that are going to be in the neighborhood of, I understand, around uh, half, a, half a million and up, 500,000. But I bring that up because uh, people don't realize, and it's easy to say, well, and, and I disagree with this, that uh, development doesn't pay or growth doesn't pay. It doesn't provide enough revenue. Well, I, I think that's that's not true. So um, again, some of you or all of you may disagree with that statement, but I I believe that for this community to grow, and you know I look out at this audience, and I can say this because I'm one of you. You know, it is an audience of people who are more than 50 years old for the most part. We've got a few exceptions in the tray, for example. Is, an exception. Ryder back there is an exception, but um, and a few others. So one of the things that I think needs to concern us, now I'm rolling into the Republican Party business. I am a Republican, been a lifelong Republican. And I vote for Republican. A lot of times I hold my nose, but I vote Republican. And I get concerned about our party uh, that we aren't attracting enough young people. And, and seriously, uh, enough people, uh, or really anybody, you look there, I don't, there's, there's not a black person in this room. There's not a Latino in this room today. And, and why is that? A lot, of, a lot of times Maria Davis shows up and all she's talked, and uh, she came to this country, I don't know if she came legal or not, but all, all anybody wants to talk about is immigration and you know let's uh, let's send everybody home well i don't know some of you who do, who cut your lawn and who does a lot of the other services that uh, that you and i use but i think when it comes to taxes and i'll get back off my soap opera before you get give me the hook and ask me to leave but i feel very strongly that that our party my party, your party, has got to do something to attract young men and women who philosophically believe like we do, but they come at it a different way. You know, when I, when I came to Reno 40 years ago, it's not the Reno we have now. No way. Now, those of you that are, were, are natives or born and raised here, uh, you've seen the most change. It's, it's not the Reno that we that we knew even 10 years ago. It's not the same Reno that's going to be here five years from now. So for my party to begin to embrace that, that there are different ways to solve problems, and I'm, and I'm saying this to bring it back to the election of our legislature in 2019. If we don't elect Republicans, and they have an R after the name. Forget this rhino stuff and all that, in my opinion. Forget that. I mean, th there shouldn't be a litmus test of who's a Republican and who's not a Republican. Who's, who's a better Republican than I am? Who's a worse Republican than I am? The thing that I, I want is to, and I need, and Trey, uh, these are my words, not Trey, because he can disavow them, and he probably will, but... Um, we need to elect Republicans so that we have a majority in the state Senate. You know, there are probably people in this room that probably would prefer that Adam Laxall not be the governor. Okay, fine, but if he's our standard bearer, we better hope the heck we've got a Republican in, in Carson City. And not to steal, I'll just give set Trey up this way that he'll talk about if we hadn't had Brian Sandoval, and some of you probably say, Brian Sandoval, 
come on, he's a moderate. You know, he's, he's not a Republican. Well, that's, well, he is a Republican. And I'll tell you what, from, from the business clients that our company represents, if we hadn't had Brian Sandoval, and it took the legislature to vote against uh, many of these really horrendous bills. Let me ask this question. How many of you know what the Nevada blueprint is? Uh, it's sad. One or two people know what the, if you don't go online, this is the liberal progressive. I, I hate the word progressive. because There's nothing progressive about them. They're liberals that that, that is in fact their, they lay it out for us. I mean, it's real simple. It's a game plan of, of what they're going to do. They got, got some of it, but in their mind, not, not hardly enough of it, uh, a pass last session. I'll leave that to, to praise. So I probably used my time, right? Oh, good. So I wore my uh, bulletproof vest just so on the way out of here, but I appreciate you listening. Uh, and I, and I understand that I don't expect everybody to, to believe what I believe, but I do think in parting, we've got taxes. We we're going to continue to fund government with taxes. But if we have a Republican legislature, at least a state Senate, and congratulations, Ira, for, for running, um, you know, that's, that's going to make the job of the agenda of what taxes and what bills begin to take shape. If we don't, we, we're going to have – one last thing uh, before you get the hook there, Ray. You guys heard a lot about – you can talk about – Trey? Are you going to talk about minimum wage? Yes. Well, I'll just say this, and you could the the blueprint. The Democrats, a Democrat game plan, uh, and I ask you to, I suggest you look at it. The um, we had three, they had three cracks at minimum wage, two bills at twelve bucks an hour, and a a fifteen dollar bill, feel good bill. Well, they're not a bunch of dummies, so the governor you know, vetoed the 15 one never got the light of day because it was $12 is a bit of a, an overreach in my judgment to put into stat into statute, but they have a constitutional amendment that the governor couldn't can't veto. So what happened? Just so you a little bit of history for you. So the legislature passed a $12. Um, it was more of a bill. It was a initiative petition. No. Yeah. Initiative petition. Governor can't veto it. It comes back to the legislature in 19. If we have a Democrat legislature, it passes again, and then it goes to the voters in 20. Then it, you know, who knows? But I don't trust the electorate as it is. So we get a, we get a $12 uh, allow, uh, you know, a minimum wage. So with that, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it. And Trey Abney is the political affairs director, is that correct? For the chamber, would you welcome Trey Abney? Thanks all, I'll try not to uh, lecture you like uh, my friend Peter Kruger uh, just did. Uh, Senator Hansen, good to see you, Assemblywoman Hansen. Uh, good to see you, thanks for, thanks for coming. I'll, um, I'll try to stick mostly to taxes, but Q&A time, we can talk about whatever you want, minimum wage, paid sick leave, uh, while you're mad at the chamber, whatever you like. I could tell you, I'll start off by saying a couple things. One, there, there's recently, in recent Nevada history, and certainly recent Washoe County history, there have been two ways that taxes have been raised. The first is by uh, the voters, which Peter touched on, and, and get your tomatoes ready, but uh, RTC5, which Peter mentioned, which the chamber supported. Uh, WC1, of course, was uh, last November, uh, the sales tax for schools, uh, which the chamber supported. And, and we did that because we believe that it's important to pay for infrastructure. We, we believe that it's not conservative uh, to let your infrastructure fall apart. It's not conservative to not have a plan for all the people that are going to move here. Um, I've got a lot of folks that are mad that people are moving here, and I get it. Uh, especially those that have been here for several generations, uh, but they're coming. And we need to make sure that we have the infrastructure 
to deal with that, whether it's the Southeast Connector, a new elementary school in South Reno, or whatever we're talking about. So taxes have been raised in Washoe County because the voters, the second way taxes have been raised in Nevada in recent uh, Nevada political history is by Republican governors. In 2003, Kenny Gwynn uh, led the fight to uh, raise uh, what we now have the modified business tax and the panoply of other taxes, sales taxes in there as well. And then of course, uh, the largest tax increase in state history uh, was in the 2015 legislative session, uh, obviously uh, supported by Brian Sandoval and a majority Republic, a Republican majority in the Senate and a Republican majority in the assembly. And so if you are, if history is to be a guide, if you want further tax increases, you want to think about electing Republicans uh, as governor and uh, as majority in the Senate and the assembly. Now, on the commerce tax for, for just a minute, and I won't, I won't dwell on that, uh, you'll be pleased to know the chamber was boldly neutral on the commerce tax in 2015, and I'll tell you why. We had uh, our gamers, our hospitals, hospitals uh, builders, uh, bankers, and others who were supportive of moving to that form of taxation. We had our manufacturers, retailers, truckers, and others who were adamantly opposed uh, to the commerce tax and because the chamber represents everybody from the Atlantis to uh, Newman's Deli to Peter Kruger working in his jammies out of his bedroom and everybody in between, uh, we stayed uh, we stayed neutral because we had membership all over the map, right? And it's my job, of course, as a representative of my membership to, to represent them, uh, the legislature. And so we did that and laid our concerns on the record. What kept me up at night, you can certainly have a public policy debate and discussion about whether commerce tax is the right way to go or modify business tax or payroll tax. You can certainly have a public policy debate about whether the money that was raised from that tax, if we're spending that correctly, if really spending more money on these various educational initiatives is really going to raise the bar. That's certainly a good public policy debate to have. What frustrated certainly what frustrated me about the process in 2015 is not necessarily that the commerce tax was put in place, but that we, the business community, and certainly we Republicans, didn't get anything for it. We had uh, initiatives dealing with uh, collect public employee collective bargaining reform. We had initiatives dealing with uh, prevailing wage and fixing that. Uh, initiatives dealing with the public employee retirement system. Uh, for those of you that are job creators and have to deal with the daily overtime law, uh, we almost had that done until the governor threatened to veto that bill. So you can certainly argue and have another five lunches about how awesome or awful the commerce tax is, but the fact is we should have gotten more for it in terms of spending reform. Imagine if we had passed the commerce tax but passed enough bills to save the taxpayers more money in the long run than the commerce tax was going to cost them. Imagine that. So that's what we were frustrated by. And of course, to Peter's point about Governor Sandoval, certainly the business community was split ten ways to Sunday after 2015. But we thank God Governor Sandoval was there in 2017. Uh, this chamber asked for seven vetoes uh, specifically, and we received them. Of course, we worked with the Las Vegas Chamber of Retail and others. Uh, this chamber was mentioned in two veto letters specifically. So we appreciate the fact uh, that he was there in 2017. Uh, the Democratic majority tried to roll back the few, uh, uh, pro the, the little progress we made in 2015 on some of these, tried to increase prevailing wage to make it more expensive to build the schools that you're now paying more tax dollars to build, to make it more expensive to hire state and local employees, uh, to make it more expensive to pay for their retirement. And so we, again, we thank God that, that Governor Sandoval was there in 2017. What's frustrating about this whole process, and um, some folks are confused when I say this, but the commerce tax was easy to pass. And, and people that were involved in that process look at me and want to throw things at me, but the commerce tax was easy. And usually when you're talking about a tax that real people don't pay, Oh, it's just those big out-of-state companies that make, you know, over $4 million. And, you know, I have to tell you that $4 million is not that much when you're talking about gross of a company. But let's get beyond that. 
Commerce tax is easy. Modify business tax, payroll tax, taxes that businesses pay that, quote, regular people don't pay are easy to pass. What's not so easy is to talk about these broad-based taxes that we all pay, mainly, uh, besides gas tax, and I'll leave that one alone, Peter went into that, but mainly property tax and sales tax. We have, it is, let me back up. It is in the, certainly in my client's best interest, it's in the business community's best interest, job creators' best interest, that everybody in our community pay for the services that everybody uses. Everybody should pay for education. Everybody should pay for fire, police, mental health, parks, you know, whatever we're talking about, all the stuff that government, local, state level, federal level provides. Everybody should have skin in that game. And so when you have a property tax system with a depreciation schedule where you have a house, no matter its market value, that keeps depreciating year after year, and you have a brand new home in South Reno that has the same market value as a 50-year-old mansion on California Street, or excuse me, different market values, that the mansion has a much higher market value, but they pay, uh, that, that mansion on California Street pays a much lower property tax rate because of depreciation, that's a problem. For those of you that are worried that we're growing too fast and we're building homes too fast, we are incentivizing that growth because we depend on that new growth to pay the property taxes that our local governments depend on. So think about that for a minute. We need to deal with property tax and we don't touch it. And we're told by Legislative Council Bureau we have to have a constitutional amendment. We did do something this past session and have to come back again uh, next session and, and deal with that. So we're, we're looking at that. Our sales tax, which, as you know, and somewhat my fault, uh, was just increased in Washoe County um, and just went up in April, uh, is only on goods. Here's what I know. In 1955, when the sales tax was implemented in Nevada, we were a goods-based economy to the tune of about 75%. We are now 75% service-based, and we don't tax any of that. So you have to think, we're not taxing most of our economy. So your accountants, your lawyers, your lawn, you, when you go and uh, get your car, your tires change on your car, you'll notice that you'll pay tax on those tires, but not on the service uh, cost uh, to change and, and service those tires. So imagine if we had a system that implemented a sales tax rate on services and lower the rate on goods. The rate on goods now over 8.1%. Now, Democrats will always argue that sales taxes are regressive. Uh, if you're poorer, it takes more of your income. But I would argue that we are not taxing services that a lot of rich people pay for. Lawn service and salons and, and, and the spa and, and things of that sort. So, you know, that's one way to deflect arguments, I think, from the left on the sales taxes is to talk about those things. So we need to fix our broad-based uh, tax structure and because if not uh, we will be talking about uh, higher commerce taxes higher payroll taxes because again those are easy it's easy for legislators to to pass taxes on businesses it's much harder for them to talk about these property and sales taxes that all of their constituents pay so they take the easy way out and they vote for and they vote for business taxes and so uh, I'll leave you with this and then and then Peter and I can take questions as far as future tax increases, two things. One, uh, you're gonna have what I'm calling a WC1 for flood issue coming up in this next year. A bill was passed uh, that creates a new committee just like the Save Our Schools Committee. Uh, I am, have the, I'm fortunate or unfortunate enough to be the chamber rep on that to talk about whether we need another Washoe County tax increase of some sort for flood control. So you guys need to keep your eyes on that. It can't include sales tax that was written into the law. And it may not include a ballot question at all if the committee can't agree on it. Uh, but we have to think about that. And we have to think about uh, flooding on the Truckee River versus where a lot of flooding happened this past year in the irrigation ditches and whether that would cover some of that. So that you need to keep your eyes on. And then secondly, about a year ago, I was talking to a former gubernatorial staffer who said that, uh, in a nutshell, if we look at the roll-up cost, especially Medicaid, you know, a lot of Medicaid expansions in the news a lot lately, the roll-up cost for Medicaid and other things that we constantly, the state 
pays for it and it increases year after year. If you look at that, he stated to me that in about 10 years, we're going to need another governor who is in his second term to propose another big tax increase to cover all the roll-up costs that the state pays for. So uh, not to be doom and gloom, uh, but uh, a statement that was made to me and something we have to think about as we expand these social programs like Medicaid and other things that then we are obligated to keep paying for. Because you and I both know, and we've seen that in Washington, once you expand something like that, you're never going to roll it back or repeal it. And so we have to be thoughtful as the state takes on more and more of those costs uh, for those kind of federal and state programs. And so with that, uh, Ray, I think Peter and I are ready to take questions. All right. We want you to have questions one at a time. Hold on. Ryder Haig, he's young, he can walk around. <laughs> Raise your hand, we'll do one at a time. And you'll do it in proper sequence, and there are several hands. This is Ryder, and they'll both be here. Be nice to them. Thank you for letting me pass around the mic today. Uh, hi, Peter. Thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, hi, Peter. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, does the tax increase on the gas to support the RTC bonds go away after the bonds are retired? And if so, when does that happen? The answer is yes, uh, as there are a series of bonds that have been purchased. As each one is retired, that bond is paid off, but there's going to have to be some legislative or and or county uh, government, county commission action to remove the tax. Like, you know, so it, it doesn't, just because the bond is retired, the tax doesn't stop. It's going to require some proact proactive uh, method, uh, legislation, or uh, ordinance to do that. Thank you for the easy one. Uh, first of all, Peter, I'd like to thank you for the article you wrote in Renew Gazette Journal, laid out very nicely. Hopefully, people who voted for that actually read it. But I've got a question for both of you. It's kind of related to taxes. Uh, we know in the last session. Uh, there was a, a couple of bail provisions uh, to fix the finance of the Washoe County School District. They appear to have fiscal issues on an ongoing basis as well as governance. Do you, either of you gentlemen have some thoughts on how to address that so that we don't have a surprise every two years that needs to be bailed out to the tune of $13 million, $60 million, $40 million? Here's what I know, and I know just enough to be dangerous. Um, on that specific issue you mentioned at the very end of session, uh, the school districts, all 17 of them, were told in January, February, March, April, you're going to have this much. We're using this formula and you can expect this much. And then somewhere in the bowels of the State Department of Education, uh, they decided there was a formula change or, or glitch somewhere. And so at the end of May, this, the Washoe County School District was told, oh, no, we're, we were just kidding. You're going to have this much. So. Um, we can certainly spend 10 more lunches talking about issues at the Washington County School District, but if you're an administrator of any kind of organization and you were planning on A and then you're told B, uh, and you were the only school district that was going to get less money than every other school district in the state as far as a, a decrease, you know, only school district getting a decrease, I would argue that you as a Washington County taxpayer better hope that the state uh, makes up that because you, otherwise every other, every other school district is getting it and we're not. Now, long term, certainly we can talk about salaries and education uh, attainment and requirements and graduation rates and all that. It's certainly a legitimate public policy uh, discussion. But one of the difficult things, because we always hear, yeah, but the governor and the legislature increased education by a zillion dollars over the past X amount of years. So, you know, when is it ever going to be enough? A, we know it, it won't ever be enough. Government at every level will always ask for more. We know that. Okay. We know that. But what the governor and the legislature did with all these programs, and they're good programs, read by three and Zoom schools and victory schools, focusing on those lower socioeconomic kids. But what we know is all that money is flowing to specific types of students and specific types of individuals. And so for those uh, school districts that maybe aren't Title I, aren't in the lower socioeconomic status, um, those schools really didn't get a lot of extra money. And so schools like my son is in second grade at Brown Elementary in South Reno, the most overcrowded school in the district, by, by the way. 
Um, and that school is not getting a lot, all this money we talk about, that school is not getting a lot of extra money because you don't have a lot of those kids that fit into those boxes and those categories. And so that's what, and I'm not here to be a shield for the school district, but that's what the school district has to deal with is they have all these monies for, again, these schools and these students, but they didn't necessarily uh, take care of all the other stuff. They have healthcare, just like any other business, all of my members have healthcare roll-up costs for all their employees and all of that stuff. So that's what they struggle with. Certainly we need to talk about how they spend money, but it's the way they, they got, we're spending a lot more money on education, but it's the way they pigeonholed it. They didn't just give Washoe County a chunk of, a big pot and say spend it however you want. They said you have to spend it in very particular ways. Yeah. I think one thing to uh, kind of piggyback on what Trey said, all of a sudden, and it's a good thing in my judgment, people are paying attention to the school board races. Heretofore, I'll bet I couldn't even have named any of the school board members in Washoe County. This is an area just like city council, just like county commission, that we as voters, we as Republican voters, need to pay attention to who runs for those seats. And I think that's an important, how do we, uh, Bob, did, how do we you know, prevent this from happening, uh, these kinds of things from happening? One thing in my judgment is you elect good men and women who are fiscally uh, ast you know, astute, they know how to read a balance sheet, they, you know, they know what good public policy is. So, I think that's one other part that we need to, need to concentrate on. Well, I think that we need better managers of the money. You know, we throw money at things all the time and building our, our cities the way they are. I was in Vegas when they built that. Now it's an it's a amusement park. The history has gone and uh, it just grows and grows and grows because it's all about the money. I don't like the fact that we're growing and we take no absolute attention to the attitude in which we're growing. What about the water? We have to, you know, we have to do things smart, you know, I'd rather be smart than just to say, oh, we need to have them. Well, we have to teach them how to drive on the freeway too. <laughs> That's a big one. You know, and the question is, is that who's managing all of this, just who, who's making this decision that we need to have a, a, a vote or even ask us what we want to do rather than just come in and do it like everybody does. And we allow them. And I think we need to put a, a marker at the door to say, well, wait a minute, because they come in from outside and they take away our history and they just do what they want and they leave. And um, I think that you know, I understand that, you know, we're looking at the taxes for later on for us to do this, that, and yeah, that. But I think good management is what we need to do and, and stop and ask before we, we do it. Don't you think? That was the, that well, that was was the question. question. I, I, you know, I get it. And I'm sympathetic to what you say. But, I mean, I think the answer to the question is, once again, we as voters need to elect good people. Now, the converse of that is, how do we attract business people, people who are knowledgeable, conservative, at least fiscally, to run for office? There isn't a, with the few exceptions, that, and, and I admire everyone who has had the courage that I don't have to run for public office. You, all you got to do is talk to, uh, Mr. Hanson and a whole bunch of other people in this room, at least three or four of you, of how gut-wrenching, nasty, terrible policy is. All we have to do is look at the federal situation right now. There's not discourse and dialogue going on. There's demagoguery. There is worse. So what I'm saying is that we, we've got to attract people who are uh, going to think about what you're saying and that, you know, and I get it, people, Reno, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, Reno isn't the the town it was if you're a native, uh, you know, 50 years ago or more. It's not the town that that I got. So it change is inevitable or you die. I mean, just go back to the Rust Belt and look what's happened when industry moved out. So 
and, and, and one last thing I think is your definition, mine and probably, you know, not, there's no, there are few people who agree on what good growth is or what good management is. But that's a strength as well, too, because it, it gives us a different perspective. My idea of, of good management somewhere may not be very many other people's uh, good ideas. But anyway, I, I guess stay as you are. You're here. That's the first step. You care about your community. That's the second step. And, and continue to be informed and talk to your neighbors about these kind of th issues. So, I mean, there's no, I mean, I can't give you a silver bullet, but then I would be king and then you'd be all my subjects and that would be fine. <laughs> Thank you both for coming out. Um, you know, it's funny you talk about it and it's not the community from 20 years ago. It's not even the one we were promised four years ago. And it was interesting to hear about all the people who you know, we're happy about Brian Sandoval in 2017, but that's the damage was done in 2015. And I'm curious on the views from both of you, whenever you have individuals who don't just make a mistake or don't just vary their opinions, but it's a complete 180 from what they promised you. That could be an individual, that could be a school district, that could be a city, it could be for infrastructure that costs more, it could be for taxes that went higher. And that's what's happened to all these people in this room is we had all those politicians come to us and say these things and then do 180s from the school district, from the city, from the state, from the governor's office. And when you two find yourselves in that situation where you've supported someone in an election, you've supported them on all those issues, and then they come to you with a complete 180 and demand your support on that and want you to do that because often in these situations despite all the facts that are set on the table about bond issues in the end the business community reluctantly supports it or abstains or takes a neutral position but later comes back to a group like this and points out all the flaws we should have been aware of and so how do we as voters reconcile that because we rely on you to be the balance as lobbyists as people of the legislature against those forces. Thank you. You're on first this time. We're saving Todd for you. Todd, good to see you, man. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, well, it depends on how many issues they do a 180 on. If you, if you are thinking that politicians doing 180s on things are a new phenomenon, uh, you're certainly mistaken. That's been going on since uh, whoever the first politician uh, was. Uh, but it depends. I mean, are, are there some Republicans who say we're not going to raise taxes? And they do? Yeah. Uh, but if every Democrat's also going to raise taxes, I also need those Republicans on paid sick leave, minimum wage, uh, workers' comp issues, health insurance issues, and every other thing. So, you know, the cliche, you know, somebody who agrees with you 80% of the time is not your enemy. Um, I mean, that's now there are certainly issues that are bigger than others, and there are certainly unintended consequences of things. I mean, Chamber supported RTC5. We're talking about planning for the future. The last question was about planning. That Southeast Connector was all about planning. And uh, we were certainly clear at the time it was a, a producer price index and that it would go up and, and we have to pay for infrastructure and we're, we're not gonna apologize for that. Uh, and, and you know that's fine if, if certain people that went to the ballot box didn't understand that, I, I, can't, I can't answer for that. So sure, politicians are gonna do 180 and there's sometimes where we don't endorse a politician after we have or we, we give money to somebody else, but again, at the end of the day, it's a numbers game in the legislature. If you think that uh, we agree with every Republican on everything, no. Uh, there's, certain, there's some Democrats I'd rather hang out with uh, than certain Republicans in that legislature. So it is certainly, this is certainly not a, a partisan issue for us. I would love it if we had more candidates on both sides of the aisle that had signed the front of a check and not just the back. Because I know that every seat's not going to be a Republican seat in the legislature, so I'm going to work to, for those in Democratic seats to make sure that, that they uh, are moderate and, and at least have some semblance of an idea of what it takes to create jobs. And so, uh, you know, the only time you don't have to compromise is if everybody in the room agrees with you. And I, I don't know about you, I've never been in a room like that, even in my own house. So. I don't know. No, I, Todd wanted to get a shot at me, and and Todd, we I didn't get to see enough of you in in Carson City, 
uh, this last session. Uh, it, for those of you who know, Tata has been over the years a, a fixture in Carson City and, and a voice for many of the ideas that uh, he, he exposed. And his frustration is, is not unusual. Our company uh, supported a lot of people the last session who, just what you said, told us uh, in word that they were going to do a certain thing. They were going to at least listen to us. My biggest disappointment this last session was legislators, and I assure you, there's nobody in here. It wasn't Mr. Hansen. He and I didn't agree on everything, but he would listen. And he, would, he had an argument or a reason why he could not support whatever it was. It wasn't, I won't talk to you. A lot of that went on this session. And, you know, some people can say, well, the Democrats first, first time they were in leadership in a little while. Well, the Republicans uh, showed us in, in 15 that uh, they hadn't been in, in uh, leadership position in, I don't know, way too many years. But they made it work. So I, the answer is the frustration is, is there. Again, I'm going to go back to saying, let's run, let's find and run the kind of candidate. And, and you have heard Trey's uh, statement before, we're looking for candidates who sign the front of the check. And think about that for a minute. We get a lot of people that sign the back of the check all the time. They never had to made it make a payroll. They've never had to sit down with somebody that is a longtime employee and say, the work's not here. I've got to, I've got to let you go. And I feel a lot of you in this room have had, to, over the course of your life, have had to make those decisions, and they're tough. So, Todd, I'm with, uh, just like uh, Trey, I mean, I haven't been in that room yet. I thought I was going a bunch of occasions to a room like that, but it didn't, it didn't happen. So let's, re let's elect good Republicans, and then some of that will go away. Next question. Thank you, gentlemen, for appearing today and giving us some um, intellect on this. You know, uh, when I was a young man, I always heard that tax and taxes were, were inevitable. And uh, since I'm getting close to one, I would like to restrict the other. And so, you know, listening to the chamber's position that we have to do this and we have to do that for more taxes, it's uh, taxes will come. But I think we need to find a way to restrict the growth of taxes. So finding all these wonderful things that can be accomplished with taxes isn't quite the thing. When you run out of taxpayers, then all of this growth and everything else comes to a halt, and we will be a rust belt without any harm. So I'd like to hear about restricting taxes. I agree, and I think we need to talk a lot more about restricting spending. Uh, we certainly don't talk about that. Uh, we keep increasing spending and then have to raise the taxes to, to cover it. And, and I, if it's not clear by now, I put infrastructure in a, se a separate bucket. Uh, I mean, I, infrastructure is just a math problem. Do you have enough lane miles to handle the cars you have now and the cars you're gonna have in the future? If not, you have to come up with a solution to do that. RTC5 may not have been perfect, but that was a solution at the time. Same thing with WC1. We literally did not have enough brick and mortar space <laughs> to fit the kids we have now, much less all the ones we were coming. Whether they, you want them to come here or not, they're coming. And so we had to figure it out. Now, uh, the, the problem is you're never going to see a tax go away. We know that. It hardly ever happens. I, I can't think of a time in history where it has. So you have to make sure that you're spending the money effectively. But again, at the state level, you're talking about a lot of these federal programs that we buy into, and then we have to cover everybody. And so uh, it, the problem, you when you accept the premise that you need to spend money on X, then you're going to have to raise the taxes to do it, whether, I mean, and, and it's people that we vote for uh, that do that. I know that uh, we talked about uh, a, a expiration date on, on the sales tax, and, and the group decided not to go that way. But I think there's reasons and, and good reason to talk about implementing a tax for X and then letting it run out when it's done. And the problem, uh, Peter pointed out, though, is you bond these monies, right, to pay for schools and, and highways, and then, and then you have to keep paying for it. I would agree with you that the problem is, here's what the business community struggles with, because every time we'll go up and say, no, we're not supporting that tax. 
And then, because we'll say, well, jobs will close and people will die and, and everything, everything will shut, will shut down. And it hasn't happened yet, right? In 03, we raised taxes and the uh, economy grew and then shrank a lot. But now the economy's growing. And then there were people that said the commerce tax was going to kill everything. And we still have people coming and moving here. So it's sometimes uh, we need to be thoughtful about the rhetoric uh, that we use. Uh, certain, com I, I've had my, my members, I hear more about healthcare costs than I ever hear about taxes. And then I had some of my most strident anti-commerce tax members who came up to me as, oh, well, that wasn't, that wasn't as bad as what I thought it was. And so we, <laughs> you know, I'm not here to be pro or anti. I'm just saying we have, I hear a lot more about healthcare costs and regulations and the difficulty of dealing with certain government entities as far as getting permits and stuff than I do about taxes. Now, again, if in different circles, you're going to run around and hear different things. I'm just talking about for the 1,500 members that I represent, healthcare costs is their number one concern. You just don't want to stand up again. I have a question. Go ahead, Ray. Want the mic? On Medicaid. Really On Medicaid. Medicaid. On Medicaid. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear me because you don't have a mic. He edits out everything I say, so. <laughs> right, Bill? Hey, easy, easy, Ray Lake. Anyway, Medicaid, which the governor expanded, we were supposed to get money. The original concept of Medicaid was for the extremely poor, kids that were poor to help, disabled, and now how many 600,000 in Nevada because the governor last time expanded it, and that's one of the big difficulties in getting a revised program. I'm going to ask both of you your views and what the hell is happening on Medicaid. Never can tell I'm against it. <laughs> Medicaid has definitely expend, uh, expanded well beyond uh, its original intent. Um, I think it is certainly a legitimate question to ask, should we be covering able-bodied people who can work uh, with that program? Now, some employers will tell you uh, if they can't cover their employees, they want their employees covered some way by some type of health insurance plan because their employees stay healthier and they're coming to work and they're not getting everybody else sick. Um, but the other question we need to ask is just because people are covered, are they still utilizing that healthcare and are we seeing better results? Okay, we have a lot of people covered by Medicaid and, and you know have, that have health coverage, but are we seeing better results? Are they actually healthier and are they utilizing it? And we all know that lifestyle choices are a big part of this, and we know that uh, uh, you know diabetes is one of the main causes of it too, and and the way we eat and exercise and all that stuff. And so, you know, at what point do you say no? We're not going to cover you anymore so I get it and again once you expand it it's, it's never going away so for the Republicans in here that thought that you know Republican Senate and House members were going to go and roll back Medicaid it's not going to happen and it never will and so we need to fix Affordable Care Act all this stuff you know everybody needs to stop sending out their press releases and, and doing their talking points put Medicaid aside because that sucked all the air out of the room and we need to talk about the actual issues that are with the Affordable Care Act because employers are finding it more and more difficult to provide health insurance to their employees. And so uh, Medicaid's important, but it's something that needs to be put aside right now because it's not, it's not gonna go away. I mean, you're not, it's, it, you know, people used to think that we were gonna re repeal Social Security back in the day and Medicare, I mean, we've gone through all these things. Every time you expand something, you then have a constituency for it, right? People, remember, you know, the Republican Party used to be against Social Security too <laughs> when it first started and when, uh, when FDR proposed that, and so, you know, you're going to keep going further and further down the track and we're going to keep paying for it. And the problem is with Medicaid, the federal government says, okay, we're going to pay 90% this year and then 85 and then 80. And then, and then we as state taxpayers who have to have a balanced budget, the federal government can spend money all day long because they don't have to have a balanced budget, but we do. And so those dollars that the state provides are going to crowd out uh, mental health. They're going to crowd out public safety, uh, education, all the other things we pay for are going to be crowded out by that. And again, it's either cutting spending in those other areas or raising taxes to pay for it.
Uh, I think your number was six. I I don't I don't know that standing here. I don't. That sound that sounds close. Your turn. You're on Medicare, right? You want to talk about that? Or? Yeah. Okay. Medicare. Yeah, for all of those of you that are on Medicare, which one? Kate. I'm on a kind of care. Yeah. I hope you're not. <laughs> Well, I keep uh, paying your taxes. You can, I can. Semi able bodies. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's an area that I want to double back and and give you some idea of what it's like. And and Trey knows this, and a group, the Chamber from the South retailers, and a few others that went to it went to I don't know, literally ten or fifteen hearings in the state legislature on many of these same programs. And when Trey would go to the table and say, we're opposed, they didn't, they being the Democrat majority, didn't say, okay, thank you very much. We appreciate and un, you know, understand what you're coming about. They shot back with, what will you accept? I mean, it was so confrontational. And I watched, because I got to sit back in the cheap seats and watch uh, Trey and, as I say, the others take you know, very, very um, pointed, not even questions. I mean, policy statements from legislators that didn't recognize the other point of view, didn't even acknowledge the other point of view. So, uh, Trey, you and, and the gang did a great job for us, really, as not only business people, but as citizens, because to answer the, the med, there is no fix for Medicaid. I mean, there really isn't. It, it, like, we all really know if we if we're honest with ourselves, every time we give, and it, that's why it's not, to me the minimum wage. The minimum wage isn't the, the little the number. Whether it's twelve dollars, my convenience store people have to pay more than twelve dollars an hour. They have to be a clerk in a convenience store just so they can attract somebody who can fog a mirror, and uh, it's uh, it's tough. And and then. So they pay $12 for a person who has minimal education, is not there to learn a skill or a trade. They're there to get a paycheck. And, but then that forces at $12, and what do you do with the mid-level manager? Uh, and the next level, all it does is raise the level. And, and what the dirty little secret that none of us want to talk about, including legislators, is what are we going to do with the structurally unemployed? McDonald's has announced they're automating. We're going back to the days that it, uh, the automat, for those of you who've been around for a while. And we put our order in and the little machine turned. We got to took our sandwich out. Well, we're going back to that because people are too expensive. Whether not only Medicaid or Medicare, it's all that. And so what are we going to do with all these people that now had low skill, um, have a lot of other, you know, uh, not, not the education really. So now they're, now they're, in, we think, if we think, if we think the welfare roles are big now, just wait till we get the structurally unemployed that used to work at entry level jobs. They're, they're, what are we going to do? I have only so many as the other gentleman said, I have only got so many summers here, but I have great fear for my children and grandchildren. And we, in this country, we live, for every, pretty much everybody in this room, have lived in the golden age of this country. And it's tragic for me to stand here and believe that that age is about over. And I'm going to exit stage left, but we're going to leave one heck of a mess for our kids, our grandkids, and what do they do? I, I have, I don't have an answer. So, Ray, that was a long way to answer a question. Oh, good. Hi, guys. I want to say thanks for coming, and. Uh, you, um, I'm surprised you don't have security guards with you <laughs> with this, when you're talking about taxes and the reason to do it and moderate Republicans and all the way down the line and people who you think that fits the office. But let me ask you something. 
I don't know that you've heard from many business people in this audience, although there is some here. I'm one of them. I'm a third generation. Never did it where somebody handed me a million dollars and said, here's all the money you need, Rob. Go do whatever you want to do. Start this business. No, we did it from the ground up. My wife and I started with nothing. In the state, we knew no one. Rolled up our sleeves, which is the American way, and did what you needed to do. To start a business, raise a family, and teach your kids that there's a chance that they can do the same thing. I don't know if you paid attention in 2016, but Americans sent a clear message. Especially if you own a business, especially if you work for somebody and you're trying to put money in the bank, trying to put some money away for your kids to go to college, they can't do that anymore because they're not keeping that money. Why are they not keeping that money? It's because of some of the policies we see here in Nevada. For instance, they decided to have a gross receipts tax. There's no way to run from it. There's no way to pass it on because the more money you make, the more you pay. So what are they doing? Well, they're in some of the cases, in some of the auto dealers, for instance, in town, killed their body shops, completely put them down. They don't exist anymore. They stopped doing capital improvements because they could keep that money to offset the cost. If you're, if you're Scolaris and you had a 2.5% profit margin and you do $20 million, if you notice they're all closing all over the place, why do you think that is? Why would you work and take that, that, uh, that chance, that risk to make nothing? Now, you talk about this place is growing. I don't know where you're getting your numbers from, but I own asphalt plants all over the nation. But I moved my business to Wyoming. And you know why? Because they're not nuts. That's why. And you know what they ask? What's going on in Nevada? Why are all these people coming here? Oh, I don't doubt people are coming here. But I don't think they have the full idea of what they're looking, what they're going to get themselves into. So even if you don't do $4 million in gross receipts at the end of the year, it's coming to two. They're going to go to that because they'll come up with a reason why we need to drop it to two. And then they'll go to one. And, and when, you, when you hear from the Secretary of State's office in Wyoming that 70,000 businesses left Nevada two years ago to come there, what's your answer to that? You think they went there because they wanted to go see the Buffalo Roam? No, they went there because they don't want to be told how to run their businesses and what to do with their money. And that's the issue I have. I don't have an issue with you guys per se. But if you're going to get up and take on the mantle of conservatism or not conservatism or say we need moderate people, no, we don't. Listen to the message the American people said in the flyover states all over the nation. We don't want to be lied to anymore and we want to keep our money. Now, if you're not hearing that, then Nevada is deaf because they're going to get the biggest surprise in their life. You're going to get a lot of people left here, but only the people that have millions of dollars in the bank to pay this stuff, because the rest of us aren't going to stay. We're going to leave when we see the handwriting on the wall as to what they've done in other states. Now, I would say to you, Rob, Rob. yes. Oh, uh, the question is, I would question. Say, did you get You're the preaching. message? Okay, did you get the message? Or are you ignoring what the American people said in the Trump election? Thanks. Real quickly, and then Gary's got a question. We'll do the drawing. Oh, yeah. Rob, you have to understand, you know, Rob, no, no, I, he claims he's not a politician. I, I know, However, I, I know, Rob, he's sitting with Ira. Ira rubbed off on him. The American people said that, and certainly uh, Nevada people didn't. 2016. Uh, Nevada's a, a very blue state right now and i'm not saying that's right or wrong and i'm not up here to carry the mantle of anything except uh my members uh conservative liberal otherwise i just uh, i'm governed by board and then and i take my marching orders from there yeah i agree once the commerce tax is in place that you're in any tax you're in danger of uh, in grabbing more people into it increasing the rate whatever it is absolutely that's the danger and there are efforts right now to, to limit that and, and do that so i think we should be concerned and again the commerce tax <laughs> there's a lot of problems with it. It's one of the most complicated taxes you can come up with. But again, there were businesses in, in my membership that said that that was better for them than the modified business tax. And so I would encourage you to sit down with them. I mean, for every for all the 1,500 businesses that are chamber members, you've got 1,500 different uh, reasons and 1,500 different uh, thoughts on, on what tax policy works for them. So I get it. Again, that's why we need to talk about fixing our broad-based taxes, fixing not increasing, but fixing the broad-based tax I talked about earlier, or we're going to keep having to come back to commerce taxes. In that 10 years, when I said that, that staffer said that we're going to have to do that, do that again, they're going to go back to business taxes. And so we need to talk about taxes that everybody pays and not just you as a business guy pays. 
As soon as Peter's over, and I'm not ignoring you, Gary, but in the brevity of time, we'll do the 50-50 and then let them. And they'll stay, hopefully, and answer questions, because I know you have questions. Go Thank ahead, you. Peter. Thank you, Ray. And, and that's, no, I was going to kid. But, so we, we enjoy uh, an exemption on the tax on food. Why? Oh, it's kind of cool. We don't have to pay uh, sales tax on food. It's, well, there's a lot of things that are staple. I mean, you want to broaden the base of broaden the base of taxes and let everybody participate. And yes, I listened. I voted for the president, and I'm happy I did. So you know, can't hang that label on me. But I do think that uh, we have got to be more open-minded about how we're going to fund this community. And it's not no more new taxes. I'm sorry. That just isn't going to play in Peoria because it just, that's not reality. Now, as Trey said, we, and nobody really here has talked about spending too much. Trey mentioned it. But why do we raise taxes? Because we spend things that maybe we should not be spending money on or spending it in a different way. But anyway, uh, Ray, am I done? And get the hook and thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're done. Good. All right. Gary had a question for you guys, but if you'd be so kind, Cole is going to, Cole Asri is going to do the drawing. Go ahead, Cole. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. All right, so for today's drawing, we have a, the winning prize will be $32. Um, if I could get Mr. Peter Kruger to draw the potentially winning ticket. About the mystery part, but no, you got better eyes than I do. Is there a number on there? Just a minute. Here, you read the thing. All right. I've only got to tell you something. Give it to Trey, he can read. <laughs> All right, ticket number five four nine two six eight seven. Five four nine two six eight seven. Oh, Ray Lake. Thank you, guys. By the way, Ray Lake is the IT chairman for the Washoe GOP. And I forgot to mention, I'm the new communications director again for the Washoe GOP. I got sucked in again. Just an announcement, Mr. Lake has donated the $32 back to the club. Oh, he's nice. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Okay, now Gary can ask a question. I understand it's five after one or some of you have to go back to work, but they'll stay hopefully a little bit and answer questions. Uh, this will be quick. Uh, I'm uh, wondering if the, the the tax environment that you've been uh, thinking about and talking about, uh, if you have some idea what potentially the Tesla bill is going to do for the tax environment and second and third generation business marketing from that. Um, have you have been able to calculate any tax eventual tax potential on a six billion dollar build? And and secondly, I would ask, would you be able to apply that uh, calculation to the ninety seven billion dollar Yucca Mountain build? Hi, I uh, goodness, save the best for last, I guess. Um, I don't know the calculation of of how much money that'll bring. Of course, Tesla, you have to calculate the, the tax breaks they're getting over X amount of years, right? And and uh, depending on how many employees they hire and, and when, obviously you're gonna have the secondary effects of all the businesses like Panasonic and others that are gonna be here because Tesla's here. And I don't have those numbers, uh, but we're certainly gonna have to deal with the growth of all those employees. Because by the way, Story County doesn't build houses. And so they're all gonna live here or in one of the other surrounding counties. And so, uh, sometimes folks in Washoe County are concerned about that effect is that the Washoe County voters and people are, and taxpayers are going to pay for the effects of Tesla in another county. Uh, a lot of people worry that because of the tax breaks were given Tesla, um, 
that we're going to miss money that should be going to the school district here. Well, again, they're in Story County. So even if we gave them zero tax breaks, Washoe County still wouldn't be uh, receiving that the Story County School District would. So um, Yucca Mountains Fund, the, uh, the chairman of the House Energy Committee is John Shimkus from Illinois. And he has told me on multiple occasions when I go back to D.C. and chat with him uh, that once Harry Reid was gone, Yucca Mountain was coming. And uh, he is determined uh, to bring Yucca Mountain here. Illinois has the, probably the largest uh, backlog of, of nuclear waste stored in their state. And he wants to come here. And uh, with Harry Reid gone, there's a very good chance. Now, Nevada should be making deals and talking about it instead of having their hands folded and having it uh, shoved up us. <laughs> so. so, Gary, I yield my time to the gentleman from Canada. <laughs> <laughs>